the next session is attacking mobile broadband modems like a criminal would, and your speaker is Andreas Lind. Hi, everyone. Nice to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Andreas Lind. Uh, th this is a 25-minute talk, so I won't really have time to go into as much detail as I would have wanted to, but check my white paper. Uh, there's a lot more info there. Okay, so let's get going then. Uh, mandatory slide about me. I work as a security analyst for a company called iSecure Sweden in Sweden because I'm Swedish. Uh, I do a lot of, you know, malware analysis and uh, intrusion detection and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm a technical generalist. I know a little bit of everything. Uh, I do like web uh, and there's going to be some web in this talk. Uh, I'm not really an expert on anything, though, so I hope you're not expecting too much. Okay, so the agenda for today's talk. I'm going to start with a brief introduction on, you know, what's the point of, of, of this talk. Uh, then we're going to look at our targets, which are basically USB modems, like dongles. And then we're going to go into some attacks, uh, and I will have some demos. Uh, I will do one live demo and one uh, recorded because I can't seem to get coverage on one of the modems here for some strange reason. Uh, and then there's going to be a summary. Okay, so let's go. Uh, introduction. So what is this talk about? So has anyone in here not seen this cartoon? This is kind of, you know, this holds so much truth because what the guy in the bottom picture is doing, Robert Packerman, is actually what you know criminal attackers are doing all the time. They're taking the path of least resistance. They're not making it harder for themselves than they have to. And whereas the guy in the top picture, he's like us in here. We're like, hmm, how can I make this as complicated as possible because it's fun, right? But we're going to do this as a criminal would. So we're going to actually take a look at some, some practical attacks on USB modems that are likely to happen in the wild or is probably in a lot of cases already happening simply because they're easy to execute, uh, path of least resistance, and have great potential for paying off. So if you have one of these modems, uh, I suggest you maybe get some other means of connecting to the internet for a while. Okay, so why USB modems then? Well, they're actually very popular. So in 2013, there were about 130 million devices shipped, and that's kind of a lot. Uh, but there's, there are not a lot of vendors. So Huawei and CTE, they practically own this market. They have like a huge market share. And this means that there's not a lot of models out there because these vendors have nothing to gain on, you know, pumping out a lot of different models. And the different models that they do uh, ship, uh, they share a lot of code, they share a lot of frameworks, etc. So if we can if we can get one attack working on one device, there's a pretty big chance that that exact attack will work on other devices too which is good because we can make the attack scale, right? Uh, so let's take a look at our targets then. And uh, this is kind of high level because I don't have much time. Um, so for the scope, I've looked on devices from the two biggest vendors, which are Huawei and CT, as I said. These vendors uh, had a combined market share of more than 80% for mobile broadband back in 2011, I don't have any newer numbers than that because that kind of statistics cost money and I don't have a lot of money, so buy me beer. Um, and I've focused on one device from each. Uh, so the Huawei E3276 and the CTMF821D. And these are, you know, like high-end devices from these vendors' product lines. Uh, I've looked at other devices too, and I found that these two represent the rest fairly well in terms of attack surface. 
Uh, and the main goal was to identify the common attack surface to see so what kind of attacks are going to work uh, on, a, on a larger scale. Uh, so this is not a talk about specific vulnerabilities in specific devices. It's more general, but I'm going to show you examples, and those examples are, of course, somewhat specific. Uh, okay, so USB modems in a nutshell. Uh, these things run embedded Linux. They're basically small Linux servers that boot up when you plug them into your computer. Um, and they have a lot of mobile capabilities, so they do like GSM, 3D, 4D, SMS. They're basically phones that you cannot make phone calls with. They have a SIM card, the SIM card has a phone number, and so on. Uh, these uh, devices has a web interface for user interaction. And this is part of, of the carrier branding, because these devices are usually branded with the telecom carrier. Uh, so when the carrier goes to, uh, to a vendor, they, they like say, uh, I want a modem, I want it to be able to do this and this and this, and I want the user interface to be web. And this seems to be the path a lot of carriers are taking. Uh, and this is, of course, what will be Attacking, uh, and these devices does not have any authentication, and this may, you know, seem in a room like this with a, with a lot of security people as, oh, that's terrible, and yeah, it kind of is, but it kind of makes sense too because if you compare it to like a Wi-Fi router that usually has authentication, on a Wi-Fi router you'd expect more than one user to be on the Wi-Fi network, but not everyone should have administrative access to the, to the router. Whereas in this case, this is a single user device. You physically plug it into your computer. So anyone using it is in physical possession of it, and hence should have administrative access to it. Right? Kind of makes sense. Okay, so the network topology for, for these things work very similar to a Wi-Fi setup. You, you, you get your private network between the modem and the computer, and the modem is like the DNS, the default gateway, the CP server, and everything like that. And it has the web server too. So the, the, the biggest difference between Wi-Fi and this setup is that this uh, device is physically plugged into to, to your computer, whereas uh, whereas your Wi-Fi router isn't. Okay, now we're getting to the to the fun part, the attacks, or what would Robert Hackerman do? Remember, Robert Hackerman was the guy in the first picture. So, before we get going, we need to establish some ground rules, because we're doing this uh, as criminals. So, our objectives are, number one, to make money. That's always number one. Uh, number two, to steal information, because information can potentially be turned into money. And number three, to gain some persistence, to be able to do number one and number two over and over again, make a lot of money, like this guy. Uh, and basically, the only prereq that we've got is it should be remote attacks only, because we don't have physical access to, to the things. We, we might have, but in, in the most cases, we don't. Okay, so I'm going to be going over this in terms of areas, uh, and the first area we're going to look at is configuration, so attacking config configuration. Uh, uh, these things are like end-user products, so they don't really have advanced configuration because carriers doesn't want uh, their users to be able to break functionality by doing stupid config configuration, so most of that has been removed, uh, possibly in the carrier branding. Uh, so, the first attack I was looking at was DNS poisoning. This has been done with Wi-Fi routers a lot by changing the network configuration. Now, as I said, these things don't really have a network configuration like that. Under net network configuration, it's basically enable, disable roaming, that kind of thing. Uh, but there is something called a connection profile, uh, and these things, these things come pre-configured with a connection profile from the carrier. And this is read-only. The user can't change it or remove it or anything like that. Uh, but he can add a new profile. And it looks kind of like this. Not a lot of information to 
fill out, right? Basically, profile name and APM, the access point network address. Uh, username and password, as far as I know, is never used. But when you click save, there's a whole lot more information being sent to, to the modem. So most notably, uh, the parameters, I, uh, DNS is static, uh, primary DNS, secondary DNS, read only, and set default. OK, so there's hidden configuration from the user. Maybe we can alter that. So, and it turns out, yeah, yeah, we can. So by doing a very simple cross-site request forgery attack, we can add a new connection profile. We can set our own static DNS servers. Uh, we can set this profile as read-only and as the default profile. And then we can remove the old profile and name our profile the same as the original one. So the user will have no way of telling that anything has changed. And by doing this, then we can, you know, send the user to add networks or, you know, to sites serving up malware or spoofed websites. And we can get paid for, for doing the ad network stuff. And spoofed websites, we can potentially harvest credentials, etc. And as a bonus to this, we could also trigger a firmware update, also done in, in the uh, web interface then spoof the update server. Uh, updates are downloaded over HTTP, no code signing or anything like that. And then potentially get the user to install a backdoor firmware, which would give us a backdoor into a device physically connected to the victim's computer. Pretty easy attack, uh, pretty powerful too. Okay, so another pretty interesting attack which may not be that critical uh, because not a lot of people, probably not a lot of people use the SMS functionality in these, but uh, still interesting. And it, I guess it could be critical in any way is that um, when, you, uh, when you configure whether you want SMS reports enabled or disabled, uh, the web browser sends a parameter invisible to the user to the modem called SCA. SCA stands for Service Center Address, uh, and it's a phone number to the carrier's short message service center, which is what routes text messages onwards to their recipient. So what we can do here, also very easily, is to, by having the user going to a website under our con control, we can replace the service center address with, with a phone number to our own rogue SMSC, uh, have that one just relay everything to the carrier's SMSC and effectively um, um, man in the middle all the outgoing text messages from the device. So if someone is actually using SMS from these, that could be pretty bad. Okay, so we're moving on to another area, uh, functionality. So the outstanding functionality in these, except connecting to the internet is, of course, the ability to send and receive SMS, right? Now, this is going to be heavily abused, I'm pretty sure, because it's really easy. So it's possible to, to do a CSRF to make the modem send an SMS. This is the easiest attack, uh, because you could have the modem send the SMS to a premium rate number that we own and just, you know, get money like that. And by doing this, we can also potentially identify the user because we'll be getting the, uh, the modem's phone number. We can look that up. A lot of people at home, at least, use twin cards, which means that uh, you have two cards, two SIM cards for one, uh, for one subscription. And uh, the uh, secondary SIM card, the one used in the modem, has a phone number which uh, contains the primary phone number, so you can actually extract the user's real phone number from that number. And you can look that up and potentially identify the user. And then you can go on and do like targeted phishing attacks, which I'm going to demonstrate right now. First demo, here's to nothing. Uh, come on. Yeah. Okay, so 
this is a web interface, uh, and I am a user. So I can see here that I've gotten a, a new message. So I'm clicking that. And it says, dear customer, like our Facebook page for a chance to win $1,000 in cash prices. Uh, and it's signed your friendly customer service team. Uh, and there's a clickable URL, which is all, always good when you do phishing. So let's click that. And we end up at Facebook. Okay, so we're apparently not logged in. Let's do that. And what happens when the user clicks log in is this. So the user gets logged in and the attacker gets the login credentials over SMS. I hope you all heard the SMS signal. So that's another way of using this. So both inbound and outbound abuse of functionality. Uh, okay. So up until now, we've basically been talking about, you know, fire and forget style of attacks. We haven't really interacted with the actual modem. Uh, and we're going to be doing that now. But now, there's a number of different ways of uh, gaining persistence. You can, you know, install something on the actual device. It's a Linux box, so pretty standard, you know, shell, shell scripting will probably work, but you'll need like a remote command injection vulnerability or something like that to be able to do that. Um, I might have that too, but I'm not going to demo that now. Uh, we're going to do something else. We're going to do something a little more, more lightweight. So in a number of these, uh, devices, there are multiple cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, uh, and they exist in configuration parameters. Uh, the thing about configuration parameters that is that they are by nature persistent. If I configure something, then I want that configuration to be there when I use the modem the next time, right? So I can inject code into the configuration per parameters, and it will be there the next time the user goes to that page. So in this uh, example, uh, there's an injection in the roaming settings, but the roaming settings are in the network settings. No you know, regular user goes there. So we're going to need to do something more effective. So uh, to be able to do that, we need to understand how the web interface is actually used. So the web interface is where users go to connect to the internet. You, you, you go there first and then you go on to the internet. Uh, I've asked around, I know a lot of people who uses this, every single one does this. Some people even, you know, doesn't really close the web interface, they just open a, a new tab and go on the internet because if they're non-technical they might think that if I close this my internet connection will be, will be closed, which is not the case but doesn't really matter. So, uh, and the main page of, of the web interface loads everything else. It loads a lot of settings and things like that, and it loads an iframe in, in which everything else is loaded for user interaction, but it also loads the chosen language. So what language is the web uh, interface going to, to this play? And of course, language is a configuration parameter. So this means that we can inject into the language parameter and have our code execute every time the user connects to the internet. So pretty good, but we don't want the same code to run every time, right? We want uh, it to do different things, so we need to interact with it. So we need a command channel. Uh, the easy way to do this would be to, to just have the code pull a remote server on the internet. Uh, the browser exploitation framework has great support for this, beef. Uh, but we're going to be, you know, a little more extravagant uh, because we're going to do an, an, another demo, and demos are more fun if they're if they're fun. Yeah. 
So we're going to be abusing the SMS functionality some more by having the code pulling the SMS inbox. So we're going to do it out of band over SMS. So let's take a look at that demo. Uh, wrong way, sorry. Uh, so do you see this? Yes, you do. Great. So there's the user. He's opening the web interface. All right. Uh, he's going to check the SMS inbox just to make sure that there are no unread messages. No unread messages in the device inbox and no in the SIM inbox either. Okay, so this, this is an empty file on a server under the attacker's control. So this is my file on my server. And the user goes to browse the internet. And he's ending up here because we all do, right? And this is where the attack happens. So, as I said, the, uh, the injection is in the main page, so the code isn't actually running yet. Uh, this page has to be reloaded for, for, for the code to, to get going. And uh, usually this would happen the next time the user connects to the internet, but we're going to do it manually. So, what happens now is that the attacker is sending an SMS to the modem. He's sending steel inbox, SMS inbox. So take a look. So did, did you see that? So there's no unread text messages in there. But on the attacker server, there's the SMS inbox. So we got a sender. And we get the hex encoded SMS content, and we get another sender, and we get the hex encoded SMS content. Now, because this attacker is a really funny guy, he's going to send another SMS just to prove a point. So he's sending Rick Roll, and what do you think happens? Yay! Thank you. So these are all, you know, really basic examples. You know, uh, you could basically do anything with this. You could do a lot of things. You should actually go check out the beef uh, demo at uh, Arsenal. It's going to be great. Uh, there we go. Okay, so summary, because uh, I'm already out of time, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so what we've seen are Attacks on configuration, network most notably, maybe mobile. This, we can expect this for sure. Abuse of functionality. SMS will definitely be abused. There's a million ways of doing this. Uh, and injection attack for persistence and for actually stealing information from the modems themselves. They have a lot of potentially sensitive information. SMS inbox, outbox, uh, contact list things like that. Uh, and of course, this has all been reported to the vendors. CT is working on it. They don't have a product security team, so I have no details. They're just, OK, we're going to do something sometime. Huawei, on the other hand, is actually fixing their entire product line, which is great. Uh, they have a security team. Their security team is here today. Uh, really nice guys. A lot of work to do for them. So OK, so things are getting fixed, right? Sounds pretty good. OK, so here's the bottom line. Uh, the update model for these things is utterly broken. Vendors can't push fixes directly to end users because of the branding situation. So vendors has to do one patch for each uh, carrier, for each device for each carrier. And then they'll have to tell the carrier that there's a fix here. And the carrier has to choose, do we make it available to the users? And then the users have to actually download the fix and install it themselves. There's no automatic update. So the bottom line here is, and consider this, 130 million uh, devices shipped in 2013. Most of these devices will never get patched. So if you own one of these, go to your carrier and ask, to, to, uh, ask them to provide the fix or ask them for a new device which is not vulnerable. 
Okay. Thank you very much.